Welcome, everyone, back to the School of Greatness podcast. Very excited about our guest, Nancy Duarte, in the house. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. You've got a new book out called Illuminate, Ignite Change Through Speeches, Stories, Ceremonies, and Symbols. And I first was connected to you through your other book. You have other books, but Mm -hmm. the other one was Slideology, which um, our content editor, Christine, read your book and she actually used the stuff to connect with me and got the job through kind of some of your (laughs) teachings. So thanks for bringing me a great podcast editor. Lovely. She's amazing. (laughs) And you, and I'm curious, why did you, you know, when I first learned about you, you were teaching people about storytelling and presentations, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. To kind of connect and get your message out there to the world to inspire change or Mm -hmm. to inspire someone to take action, I'm assuming, correct? Right. So why go from storytelling to, Illuminate, which is still speeches, storytelling, ceremonies, and symbols. Why take it to this level? Yeah, what's interesting is I think people were a little surprised to get a leadership book from us, mm-hmm. but storytelling is an amazing leadership tool. So if yes. you look at the structure of a story, it's always about this protagonist who goes through something really difficult and is changed in the process. And as leaders, that's what we do every day, right? (laughs) We can see a more ideal future and we are to drive, we call them travelers, we're to drive our travelers there and it's hard. And we're asking them to go through hardships on behalf Mm -hmm. of the company or the organization. And so using speeches, stories, ceremonies, and symbols is a way to create longing inside your travelers to help them want to go there with Mm. you. And that's the biggest barrier is most of the time your travelers will resist. Um, They'll look at the sacrifice and say, this isn't worth the reward that they're offering and they'll opt out of your journey. Mm. And you don't want that, right? You want the right people with you along the way because leaders don't get them by themselves. They don't get there by themselves. You get there because of the people that come with you. And um, that's why it's really important to use these uh, tools and have them in your toolkit. Who do you think is the most inspiring leader who is able to use all the tools necessary to bring his his or her travelers on the yeah, journey? Yeah, I mean, I think it's so funny because I there's kind of the classic. <laughs> you've got uh, Dr. King on the cause side uh-huh. and I think Steve Jobs on the corporate side. I think they both used all of the speeches, stories, ceremonies, and symbols um, every day along the way. Really? Yeah, and when, when they communicated, yeah. Hmm. How many speeches, let's say you're an entrepreneur with – less than 50 employees how many speeches do you typically need to give and what does a speech include yeah yeah a year? that's a you good know, you know do yeah. I need one good speech for the year to bring <laughs> everyone along all the hardship of everything that's going to happen is it a weekly speech is it a sometimes i you know sometimes we consider a speech a designed conversation like if you're having a really mm. critical conversation so it just depends one on, one on even. yeah even a, an audience of one mm. you may need to do an impassioned plea but mm. um it, it depends. Like for you, you're a thought leader, so you're giving speeches all the time too, yeah. but you're also having to rally the people who are mm-hmm. kind of coming alongside you. So one of the reasons we called them travelers in the book, we didn't say employees or right, teams, right. is or because... followers or something. Yeah, right, it right. could be your consumers. It could be your listeners. It yeah. could be any number of people that aren't necessarily considered a follower. They're people that you want to have <laughs> bumble along with you into the future, yeah. um, to this unknown <laughs> place. Sure. And so... Some um, crazy vision you have. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like westward expansion almost right uh-huh. there's going to be scary things there's going to be motivating things yeah um and just incredible unknowns and that's what being a leader is is getting people to go to an alternate future okay yeah. how often do you feel like you're doing this for your company and your journey right so it's funny because i we featured a case study that's only partially done uh, a story about my own company and uh-huh. the leading that I've had to do. And this January, um, at our vision you've had a company for like how many years 30, now? almost 30 years. 30 years. Married for 35, 28 right? years we've had that. Yeah, we've married for 35 That's years. That's a long time to have a company these days. It is, it is. And what's interesting is my own firm has been through, we're in our eighth reinvention. Wow. So we actually reinvent ourselves about every four years. And if you huh. look at the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics, it says that most small businesses fail between about four and five years. So Why it is, is interesting. They just, the they partnerships fall apart. They wind up not invigorating their their um, company with the right, you know, things shift so quickly. Mm-hmm. Everything just changes so quickly. And if you're asleep at the wheel, even for a second, you're not the People right place. Bounce. Like, look at you. Yeah. You could sit and rest on your laurels with just one book. But, you yeah. re- you know, each time you come up with a new body of work, it mm-hmm. shifts the direction of your trajectory for you and, yep. and your firm and, yeah. and the whole thing. So 
there isn't like a set amount of speeches a mm -hmm. leader should give. Um, but I have to say in my 28 years, I gave the speech of my life this January. I, I had stepped back in as president of my own shop. I haven't had to do that for about 10 years. And um, it was the most important speech I feel like I gave in my life, and it was to my own team. Wow. And it was to just re-energize them, give them this moment of endurance, because we had a few more things to complete before we could enter into this new dream and uh, got a standing ovation. People wow. cried. It was unflipping believable. In January like, this year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I How actually want to. It was just the vision speech lasted about 40 minutes. 40 and minutes. Mm -hmm. wow. and it was like, I I mean, I do the whole thing. I rehearse. That's the most important speech I give every year. Because how well you You're do You're not just that. winging it. You're not just like, no. okay, guys, here's no, a little God, bit no. about I me. I let everyone, I look, let my exec team, they look at the slides. They, they're really picky about word choices. Like one word wow. choice from someone in a position of power can flip people one way or the other. So yeah. You get the full speech slideology full style. Full thing. Yeah, we use Resonate, Slideology, Illuminate. All the tools you could. You're I've like, had to pull the little, there's a little pull out in there, a communication toolkit in Illuminate. I've had to pull it out a few times to read to my own work, yourself, to know yeah, how to yeah. do my, my own, <laughs> talk to my own team. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. How long did you prepare for that? It took take a long time. So I spend a lot of time. So you have to actually kind of come up with the strategy and the vision, talk about the strategy. But I spend at least 100 hours every year mm, on our vision on talk. speech. Mm-hmm. It's that okay. important to me to get enough traction because if you screw that up, you, nobody's rallying all year around what it is you're trying to do. So Monday, a week from yesterday, I'm doing the half year update to the vision talk. And yeah. I've been working on that for a few weeks. Not solid, but yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, it's crazy. It seems crazy. And what about your TED's your TED Talk speech? How long did it take for you to That was that? interesting because the book was written. So I had to do a subset of that. <clears throat> and the hard part is murdering your own darlings right when when you write a really great piece of work <laughs> yeah, yeah. you don't know how to pick w w what would be the best piece mm -hmm. to keep in and what wouldn't so I rehearsed and rehearsed and it was like I had a coach and she'd be like I, th I think you spent 30 seconds on that I think you could spend 22 seconds on that oh so let's shave eight seconds off that and give those eight seconds over here to this only have 15 minutes oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so literally like <clears throat> I'm the presentation lady so I it would be the worst thing <laughs> to have, have me get the hook because they literally once you hit 18 minutes they come out and they walk no. you off yeah so you have they, to cut you it have to kill it and I remember I was like thank you very much I looked up I had six seconds left on oh the my clock. goodness yeah six <laughs> I was so relieved. I didn't even know what to do with myself. Um, so yeah, it was that was <laughs> hard. Really so I rehearsed, 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 rehearsed. It was high stakes for me because I yeah. it was a TEDx, and I thought, you mm -hmm. know, if I kill it at a TEDx, I knew a small percent of talks make it onto TED.com. Yeah. So the talk had about like I don't know, eight months later, I had like fifty thousand views, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. So I just tweeted, so happy my TEDx talk has fifty thousand views, and I copied at TED Talks, and they call, and they're like, hey, we want to put your talk up on TED.com on Tuesday. Wow. So it was all kind of unexpected. And, and what's, how many numbers, or how many views? It's, like a, it's got about a million. And a half. If you count YouTube, and my talk's one of the few on TED that isn't connected to my YouTube version. Mm. I don't know why, but so it's about a million and a half, million three quarters or something cool. like that. Very yeah, cool. yeah. And right. what did that do for you with that one speech? Well, what, it was unexpected quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, the phenom, the Ted phenom that happens afterward. Yeah. And um, we went into a season that I now refer to as catastrophic growth. <laughs> like wow. the inbound queries, the the people who wanted time with Nancy. You must get this all the time. Mm -hmm. I just want 15 minutes of your time. Right. But um, it, it really, uh, we grew fast. So I had two um, storytellers at the time. Now I have a team of 10. Oh, I, but ramping and finding people qualified and getting the smartest people on the yeah. planet you know all it just took an incredible amount of time so it just bent us we didn't break i mean at all but it bent us um, yeah yeah stretched us wow i remember yeah. everyone was talking about you for a while and everyone wanted to like learn how to use your slide strategies and mm -hmm. all that stuff yeah that's pretty cool but you, yeah. must, you must have a lot of corporate clients coming in then right yeah just yeah all the big leaders wanted to come and, get, and learn those those yeah. strategies yeah I have storytelling is clients. is really challenging for people yeah, you know, I, I went on my own journey through storytelling. So I, for three years, I studied storytelling, story structures, mm. um, you know, what is a character? How do you develop mm. one? Every Joseph Campbell's yeah. hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And and that was, you can't be a student of story and not be changed. It really changed me. And stories become a bit of a coping mechanism in life and in business, right? It's like, oh, it's hard today. Oh, I'm in the middle of my story. It'll end soon. Right. <laughs> you know, right. it'll have some sort of resolution, uh -huh. whether it's amazing 
speaking or, or, or not. And um, so once I applied storytelling to speech making, that's when I identified the tension and release that the great speech makers have used over time. Mm. Um, and so that's where Resonate came from. Was after I wouldn't have seen those insights if I hadn't gone on a three-year journey through mm. story. I wouldn't have been able to identify what great speech makers use from from story, from story. What are the parts of a story? How many parts are there? There's three acts. Three, three There's acts. three strikes. Yeah, it's all the way back to Aristotle. Same mm-hmm. thing is true. So the three the three acts are you kind of set the stage with the protagonist. Um, that they're a likable hero mm-hmm. and then they go through roadblocks there's all these roadblocks thrown at them and you watch them overcome so you root for them the reason they have to be likable in the first act is if they're not likable you're not, not going to root for them yeah you're yeah. not gonna be like the oh, turd can <laughs> yeah. lose i don't care <laughs> but they what's interesting is it's like no sooner do they have like they lose the girl the alien attacks them they're impaled in the shoulder like right. poor frodo right pa- half dead and then they still have to climb out this oh. great big thing so it's hard yeah. and then and then at, at the end it either at ends you know positively or negatively and and you root and and the, the thing about a story is that person's changed in the middle mm. it's messy it's ugly but they change and for some reason humans love to observe transformation they love to watch someone else transform because we're like am i like what i've done that same decision you compare yourself to them and then you learn the moral lesson they either did or or did not learn and that's why storytelling when you're leaving leading change mm. thinking through it with a story framework in your mind helps you know how to communicate um as your little travelers are right in the middle of the yeah. story that messy hard part you have to you have to communicate with them in a really compelling way mm. they talk about torchbearers what's a torchbearer yeah it was funny because we didn't want leader and follower mm. so we have torchbearer and travelers and um the torchbearer is someone who decides to lead. I think everyone's called to lead, but few actually choose mm. to accept it's it. A, it's a lot. And it sounds heavy, yeah, but it, it's like a mantle you choose to, mm. you know, Frodo got the ring. He was a ring bearer, right? And and he had to choose to go on this journey or not go on. Yeah. He had a choice. Could have given it to someone else. Yeah, he flipped it over his <laughs> yeah, shoulder yeah. and been like, dink. Um, and so it is. I mean, it sounds kind of heavy, and I wish it sounded more delightful. Right. to lead but it's like you're the bearer of a torch and we liked the concept because if you think about the places in which you use a torch they're usually a little scary and dark maybe wet Un- unknown. <laughs> cave unknown and a leader what they'll do is cast just enough light to be like oh i can do that right mm-hmm. it's just this short term thing you may have this vision the long view but you have to communicate the short trip in a compelling enough way that makes people want to take those next few steps mm. and get there. Mm. And so um, that's why we chose Torchbearer. Because okay. it also is something about fire and the passing of fire mm. kind of burns in your belly, right? When you have a vision, yeah. it burns inside of, of you. Like you, you'll do everything you can to make sure that vision's realized. Mm-hmm. And so that kind of passing of fire and it kind of burning in your belly is yeah. a big part of it too. It sounds like over 30 years, uh, you've evolved your vision many mm-hmm. times, every four yeah. or five years. What's yeah. your current vision? Current vision is to help others lead through change right mm-hmm. now, which means my own organization has to be change ready. We have to be agile. We have to be nimble. And so we, we just have mapped out um, kind of our vision for the future. And we've got this re- you know really delightful work we're doing around story storytelling mm-hmm. and it applied um, to business, to everyday life. Um, we're working on a, a really great body of work around empathy, mm. which is really fun. We just launched a, um, a delivery training, like how to deliver your speech, uh, which is how to use your kind of body as a visual symbol, body mm. language, um, voice, variety. Um, sure. um, I did Toastmasters dynamics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a number of years ago, and this was all the things that we learned. Yeah. You know, every week was a different challenge of like yeah. vocal variety and yeah. Tonality and all those things. So yeah, so props. Be, yeah, great. props, the whole thing. So it's based in uh, empathy uh-huh. and uh, dynamics and how comfortable you are. So we've got this little model that we That's use. That's cool. So, so we've got this like vision. Is that a course yes. people sign up for? Or what is that? Yeah, so I've got a, the agency, which is services, and then the academy, which is uh, all kinds of training. They come to us, we go to them. Okay. It just depends. We have an e-course, the whole thing. So cool. as we map out, um, I think empathy is going to be a tool that, that's very critical for leaders and mm. and that's why storytelling is a critical why component empathy? of it too i think um for me like as a leader i spend a lot of time in the future as a kid 
I used it as an escape mechanism mm-hmm. because all I knew is I didn't want to be here. So I'd imagine huh. an alternate future for myself. I would imagine this place that was very different than where I was. So I was conditioned to use the future as an escape. And then leaders have to fixate on the future because you've got this entity and these people and these customers, all these people. You have to move in mass um, to this alternate place in the future. So leaders obsess quite a bit about the future, yeah. which makes you not as present. And to have empathy, you need to be present. I need to have considered, oh, maybe I should or shouldn't say this because <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, that w- would be dumb for me to do this or mm-hmm. say this in this way. But because we don't spend as much time in the present, uh, it's a skill that has to be learned. Yeah. I think they don't. I think a lot of leaders don't naturally have empathy. They're so focused on the future, right? So like this right. doesn't matter. Let's go here, right? Right? Mm. Yeah. Why did you um, go to different worlds as a kid? Or I escape? think it was interesting. So I was. Um, I was raised uh, by a narcissist. My mom was a narcissist. And Mm. if you look at the definition, it means that she was missing the empathy gene. That's what a narcissist is. And all my life, I thought, she she doesn't know I'm here. She doesn't care. care. She doesn't root for me. She doesn't even know what I do. Like, she just doesn't know me. Therefore, she doesn't love me. Right? And they are uh, somewhat incapable of love Mm. um, because they're so caught up. And, and when I realized it was a mental illness and not something wrong with me, my world changed a lot, but yeah. I, that only happened a few years ago. Wow. <laughs> but I think that um, what happened was I would, um, I knew what I didn't want because of my upbringing. Mm-hmm. So we were, you know, emotionally and financially starved as children. And um, so I knew what I wanted to build for myself. And yeah. like my play, I didn't play with dolls. I, didn't, I found an old abandoned desk in the neighborhood and put it in my room, fought, put papers in it, start filing, started wow. color things, started <clears throat> to court, organize them and catalog them. And I had my little, I had my little business already set wow. up when I was probably in the third grade, man. I knew what I wanted. <laughs> and um, so I obsessed over that. I just obsessed over it. And then life doesn't turn out the way you want my lovely mom abandoned us when I was 16. Mm. So I stepped in, I don't know why, third in line, I stepped in as kind of the parental figure, did all the grocery shopping, the cooking, wow. the f- clothes folding, the like just everything until um, I graduated from high school. And then I got married when I was 18. Holy cow. Yeah. My husband and I met when I was 16 and <sighs> fell in love. Yeah. Still married for 30 four we 35 august 1st will be 35 wow. years and um so my whole life has been a quest for empathy if mm. when i was in college my first year of college my only year of college actually i um got a c minus in speech communications in college i got a a plus in the visual aids they didn't have powerpoint or keynote or anything then you had to make <laughs> right. posters and sure. props to your point uh-huh. and so yeah. i did a good job on the posters and props um so i got an a on that but i actually got an f in connecting meaningfully with my audience Hmm. So that was my first declaration of a failure of being a failure at empathy. And it's like F, right? And I feel like my whole life I've been clawing at models or mind frames for me to understand empathy. Hmm. So resonate when I made that discovery of the presentation form, it was a model for empathy for me. And it it illuminate me being able to understand that as a leader, what my followers are going to feel, that was a model for empathy for me as much as it is for anyone else. So I have to kind of visualize what it looks like. So I pause long enough to feel the empathy. Mm. And that's, wow. um, yeah, that's a tool that was right a there. long that answer, was but yeah, I, I, they're coping mechanisms for mm. me. Sure. Sure. I'm a heartfelt leader. Yeah. I think naturally, but I'm having to teach myself empathy. Interesting. Yeah. When did you start teaching yourself empathy? I think I've been on the quest for a really long time. So even with Sledology, Resonate, that, that was when I first ran into empathy. Illuminate's based in empathy, but now I'm going to do a whole body of work on empathy. That's the next time. Yeah, yeah. So we're doing it on empathy. The other thing we're doing is um, the first phase of the VentureScape and Illuminate is to dream. And I want to do a book teaching people how to dream. Gosh, I'll tell you what, this is like, <clears throat> I'm glad you said that because it's something I feel like is a lost art yeah. in so many adults. Yeah. There's so many people that come to me and say, I don't know what I want. I don't know what my passion is. This is like wow. a common question I get every day, via hmm. email or text or whatever it is from people who are going through this journey of greatness. It's like, they don't even know what they want. They don't even know what they makes them come alive. Wow. And it's so frustrating That's for me. I'm like, how do you not know what you want yeah. or what your dream is? Like, just go sit in nature and... <laughs> 
Like, don't have any electronics around you mm -hmm. and allow yourself to imagine, you know, just allow yourself to go on a journey. If you could have anything, what yeah. would it be? And I feel like it's, it shouldn't be that so, hard, but for some yeah. people, I guess I need to have empathy and well, understand that it is hard I don't hard understand people. it myself because, like, I, I have people in my life that are, like, victims. Like, life right. is happening to me. It's like, yes. well, just a tiny percent happens to you. Most right, of the right. situation you're in are because of decisions you made or uh -huh. whatever. And I just, you can, it is, like, the American dream. You can have and be anything you want. Yeah. Like, if I can do it, I'm just a scrappy, <laughs> street smart I'm not a kid, but used right. to be a kid. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like it's it, you're limiting yourself, yeah. and so how do you how do you do that? And how do you how do you dream when it's not just your dream, but you have to take all these people with you? Yeah. In, um, you have to enroll I, people. Yeah, so like in Creativity Inc., I loved Ed Catmull's book. He's the CEO of mm. Pixar, and in there he it was just this one little line. It said uh, George Lucas imagines the future like westward expansion with all the you know drama and excitement and and I was like, wow. And so I've been interviewing. How do you see the future? I have another client at Cisco who said ever since he was little, he could just imagine an alternate future and mm. he could actually observe it. And he could, he could lay, he remembers like laying in the something. grass. Yeah. He remembers laying in the grass, just kind of examining it. He could hold it in his hands and kind of examine his own future, which is interesting to That's me. That's pretty cool. And how do you, how do you cultivate that? So I did a, a TED this year, did Jeffersonian dinners. And so I hosted a team of 10 different people at TED to talk about prophetic imagination. Mm. Is it cult? Are you born with it or can you cultivate it? Um, because that's a curiosity of mine. How do you, how's it that you know what the next book is you want to write, right? It's like, are you cultivating this curiosity <clears throat> mm -hmm. or is it just something you know you want to do? And so mm -hmm. how do you dream and how do you suspend your constraints enough to have a yeah. dream that scares even you. I mean, I don't know if you're asking me personally, but just yeah. to answer that, I think that a lot of my dreams have come from pain and heartache. Yeah. Like a lot of pain, emotional pain that I've gone through as a child and growing up is like to get away from the pain. It's like, what do I really want? If I don't want this pain, then what would be like the dream? Yeah. And what so happens though when you get it into a pain-free place? Yeah, right? Then this is the interesting <laughs> thing. This is the interesting thing. Um, and I don't know if I'll ever be out of pain, but I think when I was aware that like a few years ago, I did a lot of work on emotional intelligence for mm -hmm. myself mm -hmm. and like realized, and that's where this new book topic, The Mask of Masculinity mm -hmm. started to come from. It was like, wow, I've been holding on to certain things my whole life. Um, I've been, you know, passive aggressive in certain situations mm -hmm. or angry or defensive. When certain things come up, I would have these triggers. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm aware of them, and sure, things are still painful or frustrating or I get defensive every now and then. I'm aware of it and it doesn't like consume me for months like it used to growing up. Um, and I think I'm a, in a much better place, mm -hmm. but I come from a dream of wanting to serve and inspire people so they don't have to feel the pain anymore yeah. as opposed to like me not having to feel the pain anymore. So that's awesome. I think it's just a different shift. Yeah, that's it's awesome. As opposed to like, oh, I want to do something to prove people wrong. It's like I want to do something to move people forward. That's and, awesome. And that's where like everything comes that from. That's weird. Like sometimes I wonder if my children have suffered enough, right? What is the role of Can suffering? protect them too much? Maybe yeah. you need to be like your mom. Oh. Because then what type of leader would you really create <laughs> in the world? Right. Like what? If she wasn't like that, she wasn't a narcissist, would you be so I determined wouldn't. To be like I on this mission. I don't think I would. Right? That's the thing. That's right? what's so weird. I mean, my kids, I've always supported them. Like you, they, they're both living their dream. Oh mm -hmm. my God, they're living their dream. That's great. But I don't know that they, but they understand had enough suffering. Adversity. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. My son, it was funny. I did my talk, my own personal story about empathy and my mm -hmm. mom being a narcissist at the last speak up, which is a storytelling event we do at our own shop. And my son was in the audience and he's like, he goes, mom, I got to tell you, I'm sorry, because I f was saying, I was telling people our family was dysfunctional. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, at the dinner table, everyone talks at the same time. And so <laughs> oh we're, I was telling people we were dysfunctional. Because, but when I hear your story, I started from my earliest memory wow. through to knowing that I've broken the cycle because my own daughter is a beautiful mother because I'm a grandma now. Oh, wow. So it's this Congrats. really beautiful arc, right? Amazing. And he goes, I just stand corrected because I had not remembered how far we've come to think that interrupting each other at the dinner table is dysfunctional wow. yeah so it's a really beautiful moment so it's like that's oh, interesting how kind of protective sometimes that's cool mm -hmm. so how do we cultivate this dream state then yeah that's this alternate future 
I think it's funny because I think you actually said it. It it needs to be on behalf of others. I think, I think we're born to advocate for those less fortunate than uh-huh. us, and once we get to that place, um, we it's it, we give ourselves away, right? So you the only reason you need self mastery is so you can give it away. And I think mm-hmm. the happy people do that. The miserable yeah. ones, um, the miserable ones don't. Sure. Um, so I, I, I think that's part of it. It was funny when, when we were looking at stories for Illuminate, there were these great stories of how business used to be run. Like people don't realize like Watson Sr., the um, CEO of IBM during the war, he kept producing computers. The world didn't need them, didn't mm. need them at all. I mean, they were the, the you don't even remember what, com- you don't even know what computers were back then. <laughs> they were more like calculators right. than they had um, cards and, and stuff. Anyway, he just kept making them just to keep the people employed. Now, you wouldn't be able to do that today, right? You have to return so much to shareholders, kept them employed. And he had to build warehouses to just put these computers really? in. He didn't even need them. The war was over, and suddenly the U.S. government needed a census. And he had all the computers in stock that they huh. needed, and he made this great big sale right after the wow, war was done, right? Cool. Yeah. Hershey, same thing. Kept all of his team employed during the war, doing civic projects. They would build parks, and he just kept them going. Like, you can't make decisions like that in business, especially not mm. public businesses today. So I think there is this purpose. I think you have to dream with a purpose. There has to be a, a, a purpose in mind, or or your dreams will be blocked. So I, I do think it's in. It's, and it's it can't be self-centered of, exactly. only, right? Exactly. Of course, you we can want have, to have self-centered life. dreams. Right, right. We yeah. want to have a better life, make more money, or be help, right. whatever it is. But it's, I think it's got to be a greater good. Right. True. Right. Yeah. Or you won't be happy. Or you'll be very unfulfilled. Exactly. This was my life. It was to, I, ha- I achieved every dream pretty much I wanted, right? Young. But, yeah. I kept yeah. achieving and achieving and achieving. But then within 15 minutes, I'd be so miserable. I was like, why mm-hmm. am I unhappy and unfulfilled after achieving all these lifelong dreams that I had? Mm-hmm. And I remember just realizing it's to prove people wrong or to like make myself look better than or whatever. Mm. And I was like, this does not feel good, you know? And mm-hmm. when I started to shift that and say, how can I do something to, to be a, a symbol of inspiration or to call people forward and achieve something I want at the same time, it felt a lot more rewarding, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So service became think, a big thing for me. Yeah. The biggest dream you can think of, but on behalf of others is yeah. energizing. Yeah. It's energizing. It's probably like, you know, Dr. King, it's like, it wasn't just for him. It was for exactly. everyone. It was liberation. So I think yeah. there are underlying, I, we spent a lot of time looking at storytelling, like why does the protagonist choose to jump in? Like why did he choose to fight the aliens? There's always an inner journey and an outer journey. So the outer journey is fighting the aliens, yeah. but there's always a heart journey going mm-hmm. on. And what is that heart journey that makes it so people will keep going yeah. um and, through all the heartache mm-hmm. yeah, yeah and it's usually all truistic mm. you know so it's interesting crazy yeah so what are some of the ceremonies and symbols that you create for your business yeah that's a good question you know i i worried a bit about the concept of ceremony because it's new mm-hmm. language we're yeah. introducing into the business More lexicon like woo spiritual mm-hmm. yeah it is and i i have a real real um respect and regard for not mixing the sacred and the profane right so i didn't want it to be um i i I walked that line very carefully Mm -hmm. and so um ceremonies have been around for a long long time Um, when you go back anthropologically at the earliest artifacts we can find they were used in ritual Mm -hmm. so there's something about community needing a ritual together Mm -hmm. to have collective catharsis to have some sort of emotional release together and so I was shocked at how much ceremony is in business it might not look like ceremony to you you know not like Um, lighting smoke bombs yeah 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 ringing bells and (laughs) chanting together Uh, you could do that (laughs) slaying goats and (laughs) drinking the blood together a lot of bloodletting (laughs) but there's things like um like it's interesting when Steve Jobs re-entered Apple you know the whole story how he was kicked out for a decade he was gone and he came back and his primary goal was to get people to move from Mac OS 9 to 10 he knew that was going to make or break Apple so every speech he did every symbol he raised up like the think different campaign all those different things he did were in service of moving them well there was a lot of confusion they were skeptical super skeptical um, because they'd been jerked around for a decade before Steve showed up and so he uh, did a ceremony which is a vow 
he pulled out an oversized piece, a piece of parchment paper and made a commitment to the developers in the room saying, I'm going to stick with this one single software strategy. So it's a vow, which is a ceremony. It's a commitment ceremony. Like a document. Yeah, it was a big document. Or you wrote it down? Or just... Yeah, it was. You could see through it. It's kind of typeset. So, of oh. course, it's in App Apple. What was Apple's Garamond font back yeah, then? Yeah. And then um, once once he had a new dream, uh, he really wanted them done. He was done. He was like, I gotta, we got to stop talking about Mac OS 9. And he's like, we need to really bury this old operating system because we've, we've moved on to 10. He had this vision that all your machines will be hooked up to the central operating system. If you look at that speech, he prophetically imagined a decade of products in that one speech. For 10 years, our most beloved Apple products came out of that one speech wow. of this vision he had of everything connected to Mac. OS 10. So he was done. The developers that hadn't moved from 9 to 10, he was just tired of it. So he did a ceremony where he buried the old operating system. Literally, oh. a coffin and smoke came no up way. out of the stage. Yeah. He comes out. He has. There's an oversized box of Mac OS 9 in the coffin. He does a eulogy. There's stained Shut glass. Up. Yeah, eerie music playing, stained glass. <laughs> and then he does the eulogy, shuts the lid, puts a red rose on it. It's gone. Mr. No Jobs way. never talked about Mac OS 9 again. Wow. It was very clear to the developers that it was over. So ceremony isn't hmm. so much this creepy killing a goat thing. <laughs> right, it is right. it is a way for the organization to convey to the travelers that one thing has ended so something new can mm -hmm. begin. So if you look at the rites of passage like a bar mitzvah or a quinceanera, which is in mm -hmm. uh, the Hispanic culture that my husband's from, it really is about passing from the old into the new. And I'll, I'll never be a little girl again because mm -hmm. I went through this quinceanera and now I'm a woman. Or I was a student, I've gone through a graduation, and now I'm a graduate, right? So there's this moment. It's, mm -hmm. just, a, it's just a five-minute ceremony. Yeah, that's it. Suddenly you're like different. Suddenly you're a doctor. It's a wedding too, yeah. 15 minutes. I was single, now I have in-laws, right? right <laughs> Same yeah. thing. So there is something to be said about endings and new beginnings simply because a ceremony mm. happened. And when you're driving really big change and trying to transform a lot of travelers, they hang on to the old. They cling to the past. And the past clings to them. It's normal. It's yeah. what they're used and to. And so you have to kind of almost surgically and ceremonially cut from the past so a new beginning can begin. What are some of the ceremonies that any business or entrepreneur should be using or having throughout every year? You think like what are some things? Yeah, you, you know what? It it really is about listening. So that's why the empathy was really important. Like I can sense um, the atmosphere. Like it it's for like different stages you need different things like there's moments you need a commitment ceremony there's moments you need to rally them to be brave mm. there's moments when they need to endure like it's in the moments of endurance that ceos love to pull out cheesy race car metaphors right that's like the w worst thing you can do so they need moments of endurance and then they need moments to reflect and so you you need to know and sense the culture and then that's when you hardwire the ceremony in um, to honor the heroes is a ceremony. Mm. Um, in the dream phase, it would be uh, immerse deeply. We were talking about how do you suspend your belief long enough for others to immerse themselves in your dream? Um, I think um, a great story there was when uh, Howard Schultz took his team to New Orleans. Um, he stepped in as CEO. He stepped back in, and mm. their, t their stock was just tanking fast. It was just driving in the ground and he did a super counterintuitive move he asked for millions and millions of dollars to fly all of the store managers into new orleans now new orleans was used as a symbol of disrepair because katrina had already come through and it was in disrepair so he asked them to give ten thousand hours of service in a city of disrepair so they would understand what it takes to pull themselves out of disrepair. total yeah total right, right. from all the people yeah each person, <laughs> like, whoa. not that many hours in a day. And then um, wow. it was really, really cool yeah, to serve. To serve. So they went oh there and goodness. they served and then they had a big kind of a galvanizing moment, which is what your travelers need. You need, they need a great galvanizing moment. And they set up these kind of displays. He did a talk and then they walked through their potential future. They could rake, he wanted them to fall in love with coffee again. They could rake beans. They could roast beans there was this one display where they could pick up a cup and listen to actual um actual audio recordings of the call center of their actual customers mm -hmm. to immerse themselves again in the shoes of their customers because he knew if he didn't get the managers of the stores re-engaged with the brand 
it was going to fail. Yeah. And so he put all of his energy into walking in their shoes, getting them to fall in love with coffee again, again, to understand their role in turning the organization around. And he did it all with a galvanizing moment where he immersed them into an alternate future where Starbucks was going to thrive. It's fascinating. Hmm. Yeah. And he used speeches, stories, symbols, the whole thing. Wow. It was amazing. Yeah. Oh, this is incredible. And you yeah. tell all these stories in the book. Yeah. We have, I think <clears throat> eight, eight case studies in amazing. there. Amazing. Yeah. Um, what about the year ceremonies? Do you have any Mine? specific ones? Yeah, we do. <laughs> Can you share maybe one yeah, or Yeah, we um one that it's a simple something? one. Yeah. Well, we we there's a few things. So some of them are con- some of them feel contrived. If the leaders just host a ceremony and it's not pulled from within the culture itself, it can be cheesy. So Yes. For years we would do this thing called pass a giraffe. One of my employees wanted to have this little stand up at staff meeting and say Lewis did such a good job, yay, I'm going to pass this token. And she happened to have picked up a wooden giraffe at, like, World Market. Mm -hmm. And so for years and years and years, we would applaud or celebrate each other through the passing of the giraffe. And I I talk about the case study in the book where my team had just gone through this really difficult season of hardship where we had to put systems in place. You get to about 100 people, you have to start putting some bureaucracy and process, Mm -hmm. and then you have to get an MIS system where everyone's connected, and it was just hell. I mean, you bring in in process to a creative firm. It's like bringing the devil. (laughs) And they just resisted it like crazy, and it was really, really difficult time. So we were going through the season, and some employees were like, the risk isn't worth the reward. I had some employees really? peel away too. And that's uh-huh. what happens in the climb phase. And so I, um, I was really kind of in this place where I was like, well, what is it? What, what is a group of giraffes called? What's a, what's a herd of giraffes called? Because I thought I need to pull on something that's already in my culture to find strength. And a herd of giraffes is called a tower. And I thought that was fascinating that this very thing that was already in my culture had so much symbolism. Mm. So we elevated the giraffe into our um, <laughs> mascot. Really? We have probably, th- we have thousands of giraffes at the office because we passed them around so much. So we elevated it into our official mascot. We changed the name to Giraffermations that we um, mm. pass back and forth. But it, it, it was a ceremony that was already there that we kind of amplified and kind of formalized. So mm. it didn't feel so contrived um, as it would be if you just showed up one day and were like, hey, everyone, we're having a funeral today, mm. you know? <clears throat> um, yeah, so I, I, there's all kinds of stories. But then, then there's ones that spring up from the hearts of the people. Like in this really difficult season of three years, one of the biggest signs of decay for me in my heart was that for 27 years, my husband started every single Monday morning staff meeting with a blessing. And it wasn't this hyper religious thing. It was just like you say blessings at Thanksgiving, right? He would say a prayer for their creativity to be unlocked, for favor with our clients, which is lovely. It was Mm. kind of the same thing every Monday. And after 27 years, one of the employees asked it to stop. So for me, that was a sign of decay. So they all had the right. They all knew they had the right. But nobody had in 27 years asked it to stop. Because you can't have, it's a thing where if someone asks you to stop having a prayer at a mandatory meeting, you legally have to. Mm. And we knew that. So we knew the day would come someday. But to me, that was like meaning there was a little breakdown in our culture because that at one time was something that meant a lot to a lot of people. So after I did uh, my uh, January vision talk, I was telling you it was like the talk of my life just this last January. We did a whole lot of little activities all week, little exercises to connect people to the vision. And at the end, we brought in a drum circle for fun. Just like we had this guy. It was like unbelievable because it kind of hits you in the chest, right? So it was all done. And then an employee says, because the prayer had stopped for about a year. And he said, hey, we want you and Mark to stand in the middle here and hold hands. And we're like, okay. The guy who asked you to stop. No, a different guy. Okay. Just an an employee. So we stood in the middle and held hands, and every employee whipped out a transcription of what my husband said, and they said, "No way." Yeah. Yeah. We were both crying. Everybody was crying. Everyone in the whole thing was crying. Now that was a ceremony. It was a ceremony, but nothing that was contrived, but one that sprung out from their hearts toward us in a way that was unbelievable so they've asked us if there's a way you know to change it to a wish or you know if there's some way that we can like it could be a gratitude moment right and so that's so now it was so so for me that was a sign that as i stepped in as a leader Mm. that it made a difference Mm -hmm. it really made a difference the hearts of the people had shifted incredibly yeah so 
that's, that's really cool. a spontaneous one, mm. Mm, less than one that's orchestrated by the organization. Mm, I love this stuff. Um, a couple of co questions left. I can keep going forever with you, but a few questions left. Why is enrollment so powerful? And what does enrollment mean to you? Enrollment? Yeah. Um, As a leader. It, it, Being enrolling. Yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting language because I, I don't use that language. That's so, so I think um, it's funny because when we first were writing the book, we called the people the troops you know, instead of the travelers. And it's because, well, they're enlisted. Right, right. <laughs> they're in, and it sounded very um, uh, leader, follower. Uh -huh. Like, you, it, it sounded too much like you just, a troop has to do what right. they were enlisted to do. Enrollment is very different because the, mm. the people are self-selecting in, yeah. which is very different than being told that they have to. Right. So I think if, if you have a journey, if you look at, like, Frodo, you know, his friend Sam, those guys chose to go yeah. along. They they enrolled. Mm -hmm. They weren't enlisted. Yeah. You know, and I and I think that if if you're a good leader, um, people will want to go where yeah. you feel they need to go. They'll know because you convey it in a way that's so beautiful. It'll create longing in them to yeah. see your future realized. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Um, final three questions then to wrap things up. Now, this is one of the questions I use at the end for everyone. Um, if at the uh, the end of the day, many years from now, all your work has been erased, yeah, you have all your friends and family there, and you have a piece of paper and a pen to write down three things that you know to be true, the three truths hmm. of your experience in this world that you would pass on to everyone, a ceremony of passing <laughs> of your message to passing the world. Passing baton exactly. ceremony. Exactly. What would be the three truths that you think... Uh, yeah. You'd want to pass on. I think I think one of the truths and it maybe didn't come up much in this interview is that when you forgive someone, you actually you're setting yourself free. Mm. I think sometimes we think our own bitterness is holding them in bondage, but it's only holding ourselves in bondage. Um that would be one. Um I think another one is something my husband and I have lived by, and that's if you wake up every day and you follow your passion and you do what brings you peace, you'll find your destiny. So, so many people are like, how'd you know? How'd you know? How old were you when you knew that you loved presentations? It's like, oh, they found me. I didn't find them. They found me. You know, so I let, I didn't let life happen. But if something really turned my crank and really made me go, oh, that just feels right. It brings me peace. Mm -hmm. um, we would do those things. Um, the third thing would have to be that everyone can live the American dream, I think. I think that's, it, it just seems <laughs> so obvious, but <laughs> every single card is stacked against me, right? Mm -hmm. Really, you know, just poverty to not having a degree to landing in the middle of the Silicon Valley with nothing more than my hand on my hip and read every single book I could to wow. make myself smartest person in the room. Mm. Walk in a room, tell CEO what to say. Nobody asked me if I had a degree. Nobody said I wasn't qualified. Nobody questioned, questioned that. My husband, American born, but 100% Mexican. Like, we're living La Vida Loca, not right. because of any reason except we had the hustle, right? Mm -hmm. we, want, we knew what we wanted, and everyone can still have that. You yeah. either... You either live off the system or you're contributing to the system, mm -hmm. right? And we wanted, you know, we wanted to be the ones, you know, not living off the system. Right, right. Yeah. That's cool. I yeah. like those truths. Those are great. Yeah. Uh, what are you grateful for recently in your life? I'm grateful for my grandson, of course. Wow. And I'm grateful for my husband, for his health. He's on his third round with prostate cancer. Oh, wow. So every day is a new day. So mm -hmm. every time, you know, he had, should have decades, but... We sit down at the dinner table with mortality sitting there with mm -hmm. us, right? And you just have to make sure every day is leveraged to its finest. Sure. So that's what I'm grateful for. That's very cool. Yeah. I uh, want to make sure everyone gets this book called Illuminate. You can learn more about how to ignite change through speeches, stories, ceremonies, and symbols. So make sure to pick up a copy of this book. Where should we connect with you online? Where do you hang out? Yeah, um, online, I'm, there's Duarte.com. I also connect to everyone who connects to me on LinkedIn. My okay. Twitter is at Nancy Duarte. My co-author is at 
Patty with an I, San, mm-hmm. S-A-N, which is short for Sanchez. Okay, very cool. And yeah. do you hang out on Twitter yourself? Do you yeah. connect with people? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Are you on Instagram as well or not? You know what? I'm not as good at not Instagram. Yet. Twitter and LinkedIn, you're there. <laughs> and and Facebook somewhat. I'm okay. I'm trying to like, cool. I don't paste, post up pictures of my grandson up right, there because right, I'm right, like, right. I don't want any stalkers. <laughs> my grandkid, sure, but sure. I'm trying to figure it out. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, before I ask the final question, I want to take a moment to acknowledge you uh, for your Ability to turn all your pain into a lot of wow. people's pleasure. You too, and man. Ability to be consistent and live your American dream because mm-hmm. it sounds like you had a lot against you and you could have easily allowed the system to support you, but you really mm-hmm. contributed in a huge way to more than just the system, but the world and, and, and everyone's needs. I mean, you're making an impact on mm-hmm. so many people's lives because stories are everything and it's a lost yeah. art form. And you're allowing businesses, individuals, people who want to build relationships personal or, or corporate to really bring their dreams to life yeah. without these stories and these tools and your consistent vision of giving these to people, we wouldn't be where we are. So I want to acknowledge you for that. Well, I love that. Yeah. And I think you're very much uh, similar, right? I think Thank that you. pain and the quest for healing mm-hmm. it has driven you into a super lovely guy. I appreciate this was it. was very fun. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, my final question is yeah. what's your definition of greatness? I think to define <laughs> greatness, you have to understand leastness. I don't know what the opposite mm-hmm. of greatness is, but I think that if you want to be great, you have to understand the least of these, right? And I think having come from that place, um, it's easier to recognize, but I think the truly great Mm. will help the least find their greatness. And I think that's kind of where you're at, right? You're like going back and trying to pull greatness out of those who feel like they're least. And that to me is greatness. Mm. It's so good to meet you. I really admire what you're doing. Thank you. Hey guys, Lewis Howes here, and thanks so much for checking out this video and this interview. I hope you loved it. If you did, make sure to leave a comment below and share this with your friends. Also, I've got a huge announcement. The Summit of Greatness is coming very soon. If you love the School of Greatness podcast, if you love these interviews and you want more, you want to connect with some of these speakers in person, you want to connect with me and other people just like you who watch and listen to these interviews, then make sure to sign up for The Summit of Greatness. Go to summitofgreatness.com to learn more. You can check out more about the video that we have that we created for the summit. There's a link in the description below as well. It's summitofgreatness.com. Check it out right now. I hope to see you there. And again, thanks so much for watching this video.